Hello, hello, Heather Jean here. I'm here with Confidence Your Cabaret, all things confidence, and we have an amazing episode coming up. I'm so excited for this episode. And actually, we've we've had a, a cup. This will be our second proper conversation now, um, because. Uh, I've also recorded uh, on their uh, podcast as well. So um, so we'll t fill you in on all of that. Um, anything about confidence, personal life, work life or stage life, what you will likely find is that you have confidence in some areas of your life and not so much in other areas of your life, or you might have more goals in other areas of your life. So for example, you might have, you know, feel absolutely confident in your work life, and then in your personal life, not so much. And so we're always looking for things that inform and build our confidence. And uh, my guest here today is absolutely no exception with, with sharing uh, confidence tips. So Amy Kirshner, welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you, I'm so super excited to be here. I, I'm so excited to carry on a conversation. Um, no. I, I know. <laughs> you know when sometimes, and, we, and listeners will recognize this as well, sometimes when you meet people and you're just like, yeah, we could talk for days. And, right and we, we, we are certainly in that relationship. So let me tell you a little bit about Emmy. So Emmy is a serial entrepreneur, coach, and the host of Tribe of Leaders podcast which if you go check it out, you will uh, in the near future or in the next few months, you will find that I'm also a guest there. So we share lots of lots of confidence um, and imposter syndrome tips there as well. Yeah. But Emily, Emmy masterfully uh, combines intuitive abilities, which I love and intuitive. We, we need to go into that with analytical sense to help driven career, creative entrepreneurs who feel like they're still wearing all the hats on their business to become visionary CEOs. And, you know, that is such an important thing. So I just want to pause there before I continue with it, is that so often when we're solopreneurs or when, or even if you're employed and you're working from home and so you're kind of like geographically isolated from your team, you can feel like you're really isolated and um, wearing so many hats and it can be really hard to even understand where we get the support from and when we're visionary CEOs we are working on our business and not so much in our mm -hmm. business so we're going to be talking about that and I know Emmy will have lots to share there I, I do <laughs> I'm just so excited Emmy helps business owners maximize energy and attain exceptional performance for themselves and for their teams along with teaching five key strategies for for being a democratic dictator need need to talk about democratic <laughs> dictator i love that it's hilarious um, and that fosters open communication team relations based on leadership skills that she's learned as a single mom uh, starting multiple businesses so as the host of tribe of leaders podcast emmy interviews successful entrepreneurs yay that's so oh, oh that's so that's so flattering um because i was one of those uh I, but those successful entrepreneurs share their stories of success and failure and growing their skills along the way and so i i love that you talk about uh democratic dictator let's start there emmy thank you for being here <laughs> what is a yeah. democratic dictator all right so i was a single mom for well i still am a single mom i'll be a single mom forever but and my kids are grown but i was a single mom starting when my boys were like five and seven and we and i have to give you the whole story just so you can hear the evolution mm -hmm. of like how this works in business because my kids really taught me everything I know about leadership and, and it plays in both places perfectly because you're still talking about humans and different personalities and guidance as a leader in business. So for me, I'm, I don't know, I was in my like early thirties, I think, you know, and my ex-husband had moved. I live in Pennsylvania, I live in Philadelphia, and my ex-husband had moved an hour and a half away in New Jersey. So it was like me, except for those, you know, two weekends a month where I had the 48 hour break to like whip through the house, clean it, get all the groceries, errands, all that stuff done, where they weren't like, you know, my kids weren't, you know, helping, and I'm air quoting the helping. Um, or complaining. And that's what it really came down to was I think they were a little bit, I was a couple of years into being single mom and I, you know, their toys were had exploded 
my younger guy was in Legos, so probably somewhere early in the morning, late at night, I'd stepped on one and injured you know, my foot. <laughs> and the most painful say, experience. If you've never stepped on Lego, it is the most painful thing. Oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. It's awful. Awful. Anyways, and it's a surprise too, right? Like you yeah. never see them coming. I mean, not that obviously you would when you're stepping on anything that you don't want to, but it's, you think you've got them all and there's one tiny sharp little piece somewhere. Anyways, I, I got into a place where I was really frustrated and we weren't doing anything fun. So I had to sit down with them multiple times because it took a lot of reinforcing, but I was determined where we started having this conversation about like, you have to pitch in, you have to help. Like you guys are old enough to put your toys away and do some dishes and you know, et cetera, et cetera. So I, one, I forced them to be independent um, really early and, and with guidance and with mentorship, but it also created this really open relationship where they were given a say in a lot of things that we did as a family. Um, and that's where the democratic piece comes, was that because they were participating in a way that was kind of different than um, a lot of kids participate, they also got to say where, you know, we were going on vacation, sometimes what we were eating for, you know, for dinner, what just different decisions, I think. And I would also give them the opportunity, like they had an ATM or debit card as early as they could possibly um, get one. So they had opportunity to really mess up and not have any severe consequence because I was, we were talking about money and what that looked like, et cetera. So I gave them a lot of space and very few rules um, with the caveat that I am still the parent and there was a hard boundary. So particularly as teenagers, like there were certain rules that, that you don't cross. Like that was it. Like it was kind of an all or nothing. And that's where the dictator comes into play. So it really gave them a sense of freedom. I wasn't breathing down their neck. All of our stuff was getting done. We move very fluidly. And now that they're 20 and 22, when we're together, we move fluidly in just the general day-to-day -day stuff of everybody's working to get the thing done, even if it's just clearing the table. Um, but there's not a lot of communication anymore because it happens, it happens very intuitively. Um, and that's been super fun. And you can mimic that in your teams, right? Yeah. Yeah, you really can. And I think you, you, you know, it, a lot of times, you know, I mean, that's where we compare leaders to managers, right? Managers manage the task and, and can often overmanage or micromanage the, the, the details yeah. so that there's no room for creativity and intuition and trial and error and, and, and all of those kind of things. So I think it's a beautiful analogy to, to leadership as well. Thank you. It's been really cool to see them now because I got a lot of flack about they're too young to be doing X, Y, and Z. Um, they, you know, I'm not pushing them enough to do X, Y, and Z. They should be doing blah, 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 like insert, whether it's sports, school. Um, and my kids were very different. Matthew, my younger guy, has um, some learning challenges and has audio, visual, and sensory processing disorders. And Brian has a very high IQ, is a complete entrepreneur. Um, school was not his thing. And it was really challenging for me to like stay grounded into what I knew was the right thing for us with all the external kind of commotion going on about how it wasn't doing it right. And now my kids are 20 and 22 and Matthew, my younger guy graduated um, from Thaddeus Stevens, which is here in Pennsylvania, but he is doing woodworking and cabinet making, got a job before he graduated from, from school. Brian has his own side gig and then works for a company and he's 22 and they're both really happy kind, caring, empathetic human beings, but they're also really strong in like, this is what I want. This is my boundary. This, I'm going to go get this. 
So instilling that confidence in they don't have to go down the beaten path of it has to look like four years in the U.S., four years of high school and four years of college. Mm -hmm. so. And they also don't they, they also didn't have to learn in the real world some of those lessons because you made it safe for them and set it up so that they could learn from their mm -hmm. mistakes in a in an innocent or safe way. Um, yeah. The thing that strikes me um, from from what you've shared that is so in common in business is around that uh, understanding of our values. So, you know, because you've talked about them being kind and caring and, you know, really not only valuing each other and the roles that you play mm -hmm. in, you know, in, in your case, in, in your example, um, you know, running a household, but but also in terms of, you know, businesses have values, right? Like teamwork, honesty, effectiveness, those kind of things, right? right. So, so, so really, it, when you ask individuals, what are your personal values? A lot of people don't know, or don't even know how to figure that out. No. And I mean, I have an exercise, I'm sure you can Google like core values and get find an exercise too. I'll happy to share mine. Um, I have a, an exercise where you can determine what your personal values are and your work or business core values. It's one of the things that I have my clients do early on in our coaching relationship because those core values inform the decisions you're going to make about who you hire, who your clients are, what your practices are, what your long-term goals are. And when you stay within those parameters too, like becomes so much easier to say no to all the fluff on the outside that's constantly bombarding you because opportunity is abundant. It's finding the right ones that are going to be the match for you to move forward, whether it's personal or work, but find the ones that are right for you to move forward in the best way possible. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And it, it, you know, if you're, if you're talking about, um, you know, setting up your own business, you need to design and define what your business values are in alignment with your personal values. Mm -hmm. If you're an employee, you need to be working on, you know, it, or in an organization or with a team that is aligned with your own personal values as well. And actually, I, I've recorded loads of stuff on my YouTube channel about values, personal values and, and work values, because mm -hmm. it is such a fundamental thing. And yet it's one of the things people will pick their, you know, what their brand looks like or what their logo is or, you know, know. Or, you know, or even, you know, things like niche or ideal client or whatever, that, you know, but they very often won't have established what are your values? What are you living to that are, you know, real uh, truths that, yeah. that you absolutely need to stick to? And that helps people establish their boundaries too, right? Yeah, Absolutely. And it's really cool when you get either your like, your kids or your family members to do it and or your team. I've I've played with both, um, both with my clients, both with my team and with my kids. And it's it like you get hung up on certain words because not everybody defines things the same way. So coming into an agreement of what that word means, particularly when there's similarities. I think it's fun. Like for me, it's that's really cool because we're understanding all of our perspectives and then we, it becomes even stronger. We're more committed to that because everybody's on board, even though they may have a different perspective. But yeah, it's so funny that we spend hours over fonts and colors and we don't think about like, what are we really committing to? Yeah, yeah, for sure. And and I, I mean, I spent decades in, in corporate helping teams kind of reach an agreement on what the language is because what you mean by something and what I mean by something we might be talking about the same thing but we're we're using different language mm -hmm. or we might have a different definition and I, I, one of the my favorite examples is honesty mm -hmm. it is amazing to me even after all these years how many people have a different version of how they describe or define honesty and everybody would go and I, like the look on people's face is like what it, we know what honesty is honesty is honest and yeah but as i found out from my ex-husband honesty could also mean um uh, not getting caught uh honesty could mean in a business that i have a responsibility to shareholders as the as the leader of it and therefore i can't tell you everything 
is does that make me dishonest as long as what I'm saying is true? Or is it that I have to tell you literally everything? You know, like just defining where those boundaries are is, is a whole conversation. Yeah. I've, yeah. We had one when I was doing it with my kids that Brian wanted logical. And I don't remember what everybody else wanted because we had included Brian's girlfriend at the time. So it was me and Matthew and Brian's girlfriend. Oh my goodness, we had it plastered all over the house for like a year. Um, but we ha we decided logical wasn't going to work for the three of us. So we had to come up with another word because the three of us were far more creative, which is Brian's very creative as well. I shouldn't say that. We're, we're less logical than he is. <laughs> and, well, and and even even what's logical to you and what's logical to me is yeah, dependent on our right. values. But it took us, we spent two hours on this word one evening, like a Saturday evening <laughs> with teenagers <laughs> and really intense and debating. And I mean, I think we all had fun at the time because it was, there was some frustration points. Um, and when I had a client of mine over the summer, he's getting ready to make some shifts in how he grows the company and its legacy. So he took his executive team for a two day retreat. And part of what they did for this was this core value exercise. And he had something similar where like there were five of them and four of them had a very similar, like worked a couple of words that were very similar. And one um, was completely different. So they had to marry all of those in because they said the whole point of this is everybody has to buy in and agree. Like you yeah. have, that, that's the key. So you've got to keep finding, you know, get your thesaurus out and keep finding, you know, where the common ground is because there is one. And it may seem when you're a couple hours in, like this is a fruitless task and has no, no value, but it really does have value because everybody now has a very clear understanding of how you're moving forward. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And where our boundaries are. And when we get to call out that and sort of mm -hmm. say, this isn't okay for me, or, you know, I have a question about this or, or whatever it is. Um, it's interesting how many managers, and I'll use that term as opposed to leaders, uh, even if they're called leaders, uh, how many of them will say, you know, uh, I, you don't need to check in with me, like, you know, make decisions and 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 get on with things um and then and then they don't know about something and they instantly go why didn't you tell me about that because you said i didn't need to like we had some rules and so those those kind of agreements come off of the back of who are we as a team and what are what are we you know agreeing to as value yeah yeah and you know i'm not a micromanager by any stretch of the imagination like i'm much more on the macro and i've had that where i'm like why didn't you ask me about that? And that person was like, well, because you said I didn't need to, to check in. And I'm like, oh, like, so now we have like, let's make sure that our, our heads are in the same place and we're understanding things and then go have all this freedom. So I've set them up and I talk about that in a lot of different areas. And I refer to it as just setting some people up for success. And for me, I would rather over communicate on the front end and make sure everybody understands agrees and we have an outcome that we're working towards that we're both aligned with yeah for sure for sure and i think i think that's the bit is the is the no, knowing where your goals are or where you're headed where you mm -hmm. what your your what your strategy is those kind of th bigger picture things as opposed to the day-to-day -day task of you know doing five of these in so many minutes and and so on yeah yeah, well, and that's really separating yourself too from a manager or employee where you're really looking at, all right, well, I just need to get these five things done today. It's almost like in crisis management as opposed to being rooted in a firm vision and the long-term goal and and making decisions based on, on that as well as the core values. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And I think, you know, th there, there very often needs to be that agreement about um, – the fact that we might it might change like sometimes we have to have that conversation at the front end as well because people get really entrenched and then go wait you just changed it it's like 
but the market changed or, you know, right. COVID happened or, you know, so, so getting those kind of agreements are, are so important. And, and that's where the values really come in. Okay. So how, so what is your, so what is your exercise just for anybody listening? That's like, yeah, okay. I'm going to reach out to Emmy Kirshner and I'm going to, I'm going to find out about the, the values exercise, but just in a nutshell, how does somebody find out about their own personal or business values? Yeah. Or so establish? I have a list of like, I don't know, a gajillion words. And there's probably 200 at least. Um, and it's different. It's, it's the same. I mean, similar to what you said, like kindness, legacy, honesty, fun, um, you know, A to Z. And what I have people do is start with 20. And then from those 20, pick um, 10. And from the 10, either narrow to people get start getting, oh, no, I can't narrow down. But you want to end up with three to five words. Um, and depending on, you know, if you're doing it just for you or um, with, you know, other people, for me, like if I'm just doing it for me, it'll be three. And, and obviously team, I like to have five because there's a little more diversity there. And we're, um, you know, we're, we all have different things kind of going on. So it's really finding that, but it's also looking at like doing a little research about those words, right? Because you're going to get into that place. Well, is it happiness or is it fun? Right. And like, look up the definitions. What's the history of the word? Like really get into having a little knowledge about it and the meaning that you associate with it. Um, Cause then you can, you can kind of make those cuts a little bit easier and get get down to the three to five. Um, and then for me, it's essential to see that I'm a very visual person. So we, as I said, we had them plastered all over the house. Uh, nice. And I had, I actually I haven't hung it up yet, but I have one framed uh, that I did a couple of years ago. So, yeah. And do you find that they change for you personally? Slightly. Like sometimes as I'm, as I'm getting, um, I don't even want to say older because the whole aging thing is so weird to me. <laughs> it's, over time. <laughs> it's a whole nother conversation. <laughs> yeah. Um, as I move through time, like what's important to me shifts some, right? So I haven't had a significant change in um, words like legacy, communication, integrity, and fun are always in there for me in some, some place. Sometimes it's fun. Sometimes it's play. Depends on the year. Yeah. I can't believe you just said play. Oh, I, I, love I have had <laughs> countless. Oh, we are so similar. I, well, I can't even get the words out. I, I, cause I was actually going to raise this with you. Um, so I have had countless debates about whether play is a value or not. And people always want me to change it to fun or joy or happiness. And I'm saying, that's great. Those can be your words. And those can be, you, you have those meanings behind your values. Mine is play. Mm -hmm. And the number of people who have said to me, that's not a value. And I just, and so I was going to say to you, do you consider play a value? And you said it. <laughs> I'm so happy right now. <laughs> You're talking about somebody who has, and I used to, when I was speaking more in corporate, who has, oh, hold on, little blow up emoji beach balls in her possession. And it's like among the first things I've unpacked in my, in my apartment was this and my, um, my seashells and my glitter. <laughs> so. Yeah. And, and for me, play is unstructured. Like it's not going in and like free dance. Yes. But it's not taking a dance class or doing a sport or like, which is all great. Like I love that too. It is ridiculous, unstructured, like laugh your butt off, play, skip down the street. Yes. Like, yes. Just, yeah. Saying so like random, just noises. <laughs> yeah. And thank I, God my kids still speak to me because I still do it in front of them. I I I'm so
so happy right now because my children, <laughs> my, my children always say, I mean, mine are grown up as well. My youngest is 20 and, and they, they always say like, this is so embarrassing. Why do you, why do I have to have that mom? You know, like the, the, this, yeah, I'm so happy right now. And, and, it, and you, and so that, I mean, it's a great example of where values can be anything that you yeah. want as your compass, as your, as your way of moving through the world. So yeah. for me, play is always pretty high, but um, I know that uh, I, I there was less of a spotlight on play when COVID first happened for me. So it wasn't less important, but I felt less able to engage with it. And so, you know, um, feeling and, you know, uh, like a real honesty with myself when I was doing the shadow work and, you know, leaning into the, some of the introverted energy that I don't prefer, you know, th those kind of things, that honesty became so much more important at that time. Mm -hmm. It's flipped back again, but it, but it, you know, it just, it needed to switch order because in order for me to play, I needed to get really honest with myself. And so there's that, there's that uh, order of things. And they do tend to have an, a hierarchy. They do tend to have an order of importance. Yeah. I mean, for me, when COVID hit, like, I really was so excited about the rest. <laughs> <laughs> I had just, I had launched um, this program, which I actually discontinued, and it didn't go as well as I wanted to. And I was so mad. I was like, why am I doing like, like, and there's a part of me too, because I really, there's a huge part of me that's still five with the play that's like stomping my feet and, you know, a little pouty and, and just annoyed. And, and it was like that happened and then COVID and we had this space to do nothing. And I was like, all right, exhale. And if you're not having fun, then what are we going to do to play here? And I ended up creating something else entirely that serves people far more effectively in my business and they get better results and I'm having so much more fun with it. So it was like perfect timing. It was like divine. But yeah, there, there was this moment of like, I don't know what to do. And all of my clients are service businesses. So some of them couldn't operate. And I was like, you know, they this is a perfect time for them to really from a place of fear and not confidence You're like all right we're not gonna continue our relationship with you because we can't operate we don't know what to do none of them like every single one because i kept i started calling them i'm like all right you know maybe you don't need a full session but let's figure out what we're doing to move through this and figure out how you know we can serve your people everybody was like i'm in full you know full tilt we're going to figure it out. If I can't go and serve my people in person, we're going to move to virtual. And, and again, that's where, I mean, I'd like to say it was completely my work with them, but it is not who they are as well and who I attract, but their confidence and their belief in their abilities and to move through really uncertain kind of freaked out times was so phenomenal. Mm. So how does having that belief and that understanding of, of our values and, and the definition of them for ourselves, how does that inform confidence in your work? Does it inform confidence? For me, it's like, it's a deep knowing. I and mean, that's some of the intuitive piece for me too. Like it really allows my kind of gut feeling to really sit with me deeply. And from that place, I'm like, all right, game on. It doesn't, and it's what I, it's the same thing as what I said when I was having all the kind of the pushback about my my style of parenting. Yeah, it was really easy to listen to all of that and, and doubt myself, but it was the confidence of the deep knowing and who I was and what I was doing and what made sense to me that allowed me to kind of just push all of that away continuously. Um, and it's the same thing with business. It's we'll find the way there's always an answer. Like that's one of the things I used to cater. And it's one of the things I learned early on because nothing ever goes according to plan. doesn't matter how well you have systems and processes, something in every event will always go awry, even if it's tiny. And there's always, always, always a solution. Mm -hmm. 
And that's where that deep knowing connects with your vision, right? Which is yes. something that, that so many solopreneurs don't create when they're create, setting up a business. No, no. And even, I mean, even much bigger, um, you know, businesses and, and CEOs, like they're still so much into their business and so overwhelmed that they're not leading through core values and confidence. They're just in the, I got to get through today because so-and-so quit and these things aren't working and I've got to get back to this client and we've got to make more sales, et cetera. So, yeah. 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 And that once we hit that crisis management, it gets hard to get out of it. It's a bit like when we have a personal crisis, you know, we confidence isn't isn't a consistent thing. It, it's, you know, ebbs and flows and ups and downs and whatever analogy yeah. you want to throw at it. And and it, it's just a matter of how far down do you fall and how long do you stay down there <laughs> or, or how do you pick yourself up? Where, where's your resilience? Yeah. And, and that's where play can really come in because you get creative. Right? Like I've laid on the floor and people are like, oh my God, this woman's crazy. But like, I, I don't even remember what it was, but something had happened work-wise. And this was several years ago because my kids were still living with me. And I just laid down on the floor and like had a temper tantrum for about three minutes. And then I got up and I was all done. And I'm like, all right, let's go fix this. I'm like Beautiful. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because we have to be able to let it out. Yeah. And it was the, it was kind of combination of the physical movement, kind of the, the goofiness of it. And then like, just kind of, I don't want to say I was yelling, because I wasn't really yelling, but the the noise that I was making loudly, um, then just turned to hysterical laughter. So it really cleared all of that frustration and created that really strong and powerful state change. So do I suggest you lay down and have a temper tantrum in your office while everybody's watching? No, but if you need to at home, go for it. <laughs> absolutely. Ah, oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So when you, when you talk about five key strategies to being a democratic dictator, what, what would the five strategies be? Yeah, amazing. so we've kind of talked about all of them. One of them yeah. is the like get really clear about what your core values are. Um, the other one is give your people a lot of independence and mentorship. Um, I'm going to blank now. Um, <laughs> everybody, everybody does the same stuff. Like everybody takes the trash out. Like that's really important for me, right? And then really getting clear about your core values um, and listening and getting input from your people. So one of the things I did with my kids and I do it with my team is I ask for their ideas. What are your suggestions? And it, I, I am surprised every single time when I'm in coaching calls and the CEO is like, well, what do you think I should do about blah, blah, blah? I'm like, well, did you ask your executive team? And they're like, oh, I'm like, I bet you they'll give you some great answers. <laughs> yeah. 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 And it's, I mean, those are, you know, it, getting input is important, but listening, right? Because we could ask the question and then not listen. Yeah. So really hear, like that's, and then, and then really just kind of to wrap all of that up, um, review on a regular basis. Like we did family reviews. How are we doing? Did we get to where we wanted to go to? And again, there's a listening piece to it, but there was one year we decided we were going to do, the kids and I were going to do something like every month and none of that happened. And instead of beating ourselves up, me beating myself up because I was really the proponent of that, we, I recognized that we did all these other things instead. So there were two things there, like set ourselves up for success. And also when you're not hitting your goals, look at what you are doing. Yeah. Yeah. And that's so important because you can adjust it if it's not, if it's not driving you in the right direction, you can celebrate it. If you're, you know, seeing success that you weren't recognizing, you know, there's, there's lots of options in that review. Yeah. Um, and it's so easy to not, um, and you know, I talk a lot about imposter syndrome, but it's so easy to not internalize those successes, mm -hmm. oh, yeah. which leads to imposter syndrome for sure. Yeah. 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 
Well, I think everybody experiences imposter syndrome at some point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I used to, you, you've made me, I'd forgotten I used to do this actually. I, we had a, a on, a, I can't remember whether it was Friday or Saturday night, but we would take turns uh, where each member of the family got a week to, to choose what they had for dinner and what we would do with the evening, watch a movie, play a game, go for a walk, whatever it was. And everybody got to do it although they would say had to do it um without complaint you know and it and it really kind of taught them to kind of value like what other people want to do and and not not be so self-centered because it was always this i don't want to play this game well you have to you know and then there was <laughs> it was more of a okay i get to do what you're what you want to do so right. you know there was an opportunity for for each person to accept but also to to give and that's probably one of the few things that i did to demonstrate the need to accept um help and input from others um because i'm not good at that accepting help and and you know I, I that's where my imposter shows up most is in the soloist thing I, I don't like to accept help but but if we're doing what i want to do i my tendency would still be but what do you guys want to do with my night you know it would be that you know oh, so interesting yeah 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 so it's it you know and what and when we do that we deprive other people from being able to be giving because if we're always giving then they never get to be so yeah and i mean we talked about this on on my podcast, people yeah. want to give. Yeah, they do. <laughs> yeah, they do for sure. Yeah. So the more open you are to receiving, like it becomes such a reciprocal relationship there. It, and and isn't that a beautiful analogy for business? Because then it's everybody contributing towards the team. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. I love this. I love love. We are just we're just so aligned. It's fabulous. <laughs> Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna read a little bit more of uh, of Emmy's uh, bio. Emmy can be found seeking sunshine and beaches up and down the East Coast, or you might find her sipping coffee and wearing flip flops while walking her dog while she lives in where she lives in Philadelphia. I love that. I love that you are somewhere warm. I'm I'm wrapped up in this fleecy what we would call a jumper this fleecy top um mm -hmm. because i'm cold in the uk it's the kind of cold that goes right through your bones so we're in very opposite places i'm very jealous about that and i wasn't going to let that go without comment and um, i wanted to ask you uh, a, a couple of questions that i enjoy in terms of really kind of uh understanding uh confidence drivers and my first question is around uh cabaret so for anyone who isn't familiar with cabaret is, um, it's, it, I define it as uh, having roots in vaudeville and being in small venues. Mm -hmm. um, so sometimes we experience cabaret in a large theater, but by definition, it really isn't. It's, it's kind of cabaret acts, but in a much bigger show. Um, but cabaret can be singing, cabaret can be dancing, could be burlesque, could be drag, could be comedy, uh, could be contortion, could be aerial, could be all kinds of different things, but typically on a small stage and with a fairly small audience. So if you were going to be performing cabaret, what kind of act would you be performing? Oh, I don't know. That would be so much fun because there's so many mm. options. It would not be oh. comedy. I can tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I am funny. That requires more effort than I want to put in from a, that would, I think, suck my energy. I think the aerial sounds great. And I used to, not well, but sing opera. I took voice lessons for years. So I would love to get back to that because it was such an incredible experience and in learning how to like use my voice, but also the breath work behind that to be able to get really high. So, yeah. Wow. Wow. That's very cool. Okay. So, so are you going to do, are you going to do Ariel or are you going to go for a, a first singing? Okay. Let's do both at the same time. Oh, you could. Oh, I love that. Okay. Well, how are you going to be elevated up in the air? Is this a hoop? Is this a pole? Is this silks? What are you doing I want up like there? A swing. Oh, I love that. Like a trapeze kind of thing. Yeah. Okay. All right. Cool. Okay. So then what one prop and you can take anything you want besides a microphone because we're going to have you mic'd up because you're going to be aerial you can't hold the thing what one prop would you want to have on stage with you i would need my bowl of glitter oh see we are soulmates. <laughs> 
you know, in the burlesque world, we call that stripper herpes because <laughs> it never goes away. Like I, I <laughs> always have glitter everywhere. Like people will say to me, how do you have glitter on your face? Like <laughs> you're at work. I'm, I don't know. Oh, I was wearing I it three weeks ago. Every time I do branding pictures, I use it. I throw it around. And the last time, like the last set of shots, this huge gust of wind came and it was like all, I mean, it was already all over me, but it was like in my scalp, never mind my hair, down my dress, like, I was I, I was picking it out for three weeks. Yeah. <laughs> and, and happily, like other people might have been like, oh God, this stuff's never and I'm like, look, there's glitter. Look, there's glitter. I have glitter in I put glitter in the paint that I painted my bedroom in. Ooh, I like that. Yes. So my 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 walls kind of shimmer in the in the right kind of light. I know, I know, I know I'm obsessed. I'm just, I'm just so obsessed. Yeah. Okay, so I love that because that oh, that's beautiful. So there you are. And your aerial swing and your mm -hmm. and you've got your glitter and what is your stage name i mean oh it's empress emmy <gasps> oh i love this i love yeah, love there's love a this. song that goes with it <laughs> okay goes with the, the mickey mouse tunes my um my kids used to sing it when they were little so just the E M I uh, E M P E R E S S S Empress Emmy, and then they would go on with um, me being very direct, essentially, <laughs> and more dictator like. <laughs> and that's your business, isn't it? Empress Enterprises Investment. Yeah. 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 Oh, I love Empress Emmy. That's amazing. Yeah. So at Confidence Du Cabaret, here's what we do with this. So, and I don't know if. I can't remember whether we, I know we talked about imposter syndrome, but I can't remember whether we really went into this, but you have an imposter voice. And I, I've talked about this lots of times um, on this podcast around um, naming your uh, imposter so that you can talk to it and say, okay, look, Donald, I got this. Like, thanks for the warning. Thanks. Thanks for that. But I, I'm okay here. Um, and then you can talk to your other voice which for you is fierce and strong and shows up on a stage and is there with your glitter and up at the air singing and taking up space and that is a voice that we can always tap into mm -hmm. so it's interesting to me when I ask people about their stage name how quickly people go I know what that is and you can see it on their face usually before they say it because so many people will overanalyze it and go, no, I can't say that. You know, I can't call myself queen something or whatever it is, you know. Um, and so then they try and rationalize it. And it's like, no, that was your voice. You heard it. It was right there. And it's that that you can go, all right, Empress Emmy, we got this. Like, and, mm -hmm. and it's a stronger voice, right? And it's that that you can tap into anytime you want. And that can help you to to combat your imposter voice or or whatever, or to to get you know find the energy that you need or whatever. Because if you're going to be an aerialist, you got to be strong, right? Right. So you can't go. Eh, I'd like to get up there. You're like, no, we're doing this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No. <laughs> right. And it's that. It's that tuning into that voice is helps push us through those times when we are uncertain or whatever it is. And so I love that you like an like empress is fierce. Absolutely. And strong and bold and courageous. Fabulous. Yeah. Fabulous. I love that. I love that. Okay. So Empress Emmy, tell me your philosophy on aging. Cause I know it and I want you to share it. <laughs> I'm just so over it. Like I turned 50 in May and people started saying to me, well, <clears throat> at your age or at this oh. age, and it makes me want to throw up. I'm like, at what age? Like I'm living fully, happily. Like all of my parts still work <laughs> and I have a long way to go before they don't. Yeah. So I just, like, I just can't buy into like this sit on the porch thing or at this age or, and I've had, um, I don't go to the doctor very often, but 
over the last couple of years, like, oh, for, you know, this age, like, you know, you're not on any meds. It's amazing. I'm like, just eat well and exercise and be happy and your body will take care of it. So I just, I'm ageless. Like that's, I'm going to stop. And actually I have a friend who she won't tell anybody her age because she's, and she's, I think in her seventies. Um, but I don't know. And like, it's so cool because she's like, I don't want to be judged by that. Like, it's not a label I want to have. And I that's, that's kind of the same thing. Like I'm just getting started. Some other people may be winding down and good for them or good for you if you are, but I'm just getting started and I got another 50 years to go. I love that. I love that so much because I am by far the oldest person that you'll find at least in, in, in my environment in the UK on a stage in cabaret. I'm the oldest by far in my studio and I am the least mature in any room because I'm there to play. I'm, I'm there to have fun. And people go, oh, you're such a child. And I'm like, I know, even though I could, I'm old enough to be their mother. And I am one of those people. I don't, I don't give my age. Yeah. I don't, I, I, my children are like, you've ruined us for being able to understand what, what age people are, or I'm, I don't, I don't care because there is no for your age. I refuse to have that for right. your age. Yeah. Yeah. My chiropractor always says, oh, you're in such good shape for your age. And I'm like, I'm in better shape than you. And you're 20 years younger. Don't even go there. Like yeah. this isn't a, this isn't an age you're thing. You're doing not, Ariel. Yeah. It's not a competition thing. It's a, I, I, I'm, 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 I'm in good shape, period. I don't, it, there's no for your age. That's not a thing. Yeah, I can't. Like, it, literally, I want to throw up when somebody says it. And I have to be, like, I, there's a lot of things that I want to come out of my mouth. And so I don't know those people very well. So like, all right, just take a breath. And then you can like slide into something slightly more pleasant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know what? We don't have to live for your age. And that I found I was affected by that when I was younger as well, because I was very successful in my 20s, like very mm -hmm. quickly rose um, to be head of training in my 20s for a major airline, a major international airline. And, and, and it was all men because I was in the Middle East, and they all were, uh, you know, wh wh why should we listen to this young girl? And I, I, I was like, I have more experience than you do because you have 20 years or 20 times one year experience, right? But I have more years of experience because every year I'm working and every year I'm doing things, I'm learning and I'm growing and I don't have the same experience twice. So my business is 25 years or 26 years soon of, of actual business, not one year experience 26 times. I don't do the right. same stuff over and over. I just won't. I'm incapable of, of doing stuff over and over repetitively. <laughs> so. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And so that's, like, that's where I hire people to do those things. Right. Because that's not my area of, of happiness or zone of genius or anything else. Like I'm a creator. So, and, and the visionary and that works. So it's just offsetting with the people who love doing that stuff. So that yeah. makes for me a really strong bond and really strong team. Beautiful, absolutely beautiful. And then other people get to experience things that you've already got experience in and then and then everybody grows. Yeah. Yeah. And that's that's a great analogy for business as well is that you know everybody grows, not just the leader. Right, right, because it doesn't, it's like creating that disconnect doesn't work. You want to get in that place that I am with my kids where there's fluidity and we're all growing in different ways, but we all come back and nurture each other. Oh, that's beautiful. That's absolutely beautiful. Yeah. Emmy, where can people find you? Oh my goodness. Come hang out with me on my website, which is emmykirshner.com. Mm -hmm. And I'm on social, mostly on Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Um, Emmy Kirshner, other than Instagram is the Emmy Kirshner because Instagram randomly ate my old account. So <laughs> don't even go there. There's like so many people listening that'll be like, yes, trauma there. So you're oh, the sure. Emmy. And I love that the Emmy Kirshner. That's fabulous. That's that's that that's something the Empress would ex would ex expect to have. 
I love yeah, it. Yeah, I played with something more business like. I'm like, this feels so boring. So we'll just do the. Yeah. Yeah. Why not? Why not? So emmykirshner.com. Uh, yeah. If you're listening on podcast, it's M E E M I and Kirshner, K I R S C H N E R.com. Yes. Um, but you can check the show notes, it's all in there as well. Yes. Emmy, what is your favorite lesson that you have ever learned? Oh my God, there's so many. That's I know, favorite one. Favorite gotta, one. Favorite. Um, what to be your biggest one? I'm going to say keep going. Like, don't stop because you will figure it out at some point. Like, I have made crazy miracles happen where nothing should have been ever solved. So just keep going. Yeah. Oh, Beautiful. Beautiful. Yeah. I'm now picturing like, because this is my play going on, I'm now picturing the like Finding Nemo with a just keep swimming. Yeah, it's like <laughs> <laughs> I've got that. I just, I just, in any other conversation, I wouldn't have shared that. But in, but, but because I'm talking to you, it's like, yeah, there's a little song in my head. <laughs> a lot a little of little bit. songs in my head. So <laughs> we are aligned. Amazing. Thank you so much for for being here. Reach out to Emmy um, if you want to if you want to discuss values or leadership or coaching or you know get involved. Go check out emmykirshner.com and you can find out all that that Emmy's offering as well. Awesome! Yes, come play with me. Come play, come play. Thank you so much for being here and Confidence to Cabaret, the podcast or the vodcast if you're watching on YouTube or Instagram. Um, I am Heather Jean and I am reminding you that it is your body and it is your world and it is your stage. Take up space, enjoy it. Thank you so much. Yes.